Hi, thanks for joining me today. I've got a special guest with me. I'm joined by Hamish, who is a mathematics graduate from the University of Oxford. Uh, he studied at Queen's College uh, and graduated back in 2020 with a master's in maths. And Hamish and I are good friends. We played a sport called corporal together and uh, he still plays it. I still play it, uh, but sadly for different teams now. Uh, Hamish, how are you feeling for today? Yeah, feeling good. Really excited to be quite the throwback, obviously. My interviews were eight years ago, nine years ago now. So, yeah, oh, wow, yeah. It's, it's quite some time. Yeah, mine were also, <laughs> what, seven or so years ago. So it makes me feel a bit old. But <laughs> thank you for joining me. How, how were your interviews? Do you remember much of them? Yeah, I mean, I, it was uh, it was a while ago, but I remember remember a couple of them relatively well. There was one that went kind of quite smoothly for a different college because you do want a different college, I'm pretty sure. And then two of my own college, one was kind of all right. But I mean, I remember saying some silly things and then the chief just kind of looking me blankly a little bit. And I, <laughs> I had to kind of backtrack quite quickly when they kind of pointed out what I'd said didn't really make much sense. But um, in general, I think, yeah, it was a bit of a mixed bag of how I felt. I feel like quite hard to tell how they went when you came out, really. Yeah, absolutely. You can never really tell. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get stuck in in a minute. Uh, both Hamish and I did our interviews back in the olden days when interviews were all in person. Now they're all done online. So just to go over the format for anyone who maybe isn't aware, um, they'll generally be half an hour long, two 15 minute questions ish. Um, and then what we'll do at the end of today is I'll also then give Hamish some feedback. So during the during the call, I'll be scribbling some notes away, Hamish. Don't worry too much about that. And then at the end, we'll just kind of have a little chat saying, oh, this bit you did quite well. Uh, this bit uh, is you know, what went well, even better if sort of thing. Um, and uh, what else was I going to mention? Uh, yeah, this interview is uh, obviously designed mainly for Oxford and Cambridge applicants. But I know some other universities sometimes also chuck in interviews as well. And it's also not just for math students. So if you're someone watching the video and you're maybe applying for another STEM subject, it's almost quite likely that either maths questions will come up or some subjects themselves have some maths dedicated interviews. Um, so do uh, do feel free to watch if you aren't a maths applicant. It will still be very, very useful, especially for applying for those STEM subjects. Um, but yeah, Hamish, are you ready to, to get stuck in? Yeah, let's go, let's go for it. Awesome, cool. Uh, so I'm going to open up a whiteboard here and we'll get stuck in with the first problem. So uh, I have a coin and this coin has obviously heads and tails uh, on one side and tails on the other. And it's going to be a biased coin. So we're going to say that the probability of tossing a heads on this coin is going to be some number p, and p is going to be strictly between 0 and 1. Now, the rules of the game are very simple. Um, we're, going to, or we're going to call x 1. Uh, that's going to be the number. Ooh, my pen's a bit weird. The number of tosses of the coin until we get a tails. So for example, we could flip the coin uh, four times and the first three are heads, and then the fourth one is tails, in which case x1 would be four. So my question to you is, what is the expected value of x1? Oh, okay. I, was, I thought you were asking about the distribution there. Um, <laughs> uh, the expectation, um, so I could use a distribution, I'm pretty sure I remember right, this is a, a geometric distribution, um, but is, there's yeah, two what variants. What is a geometric so I... distribution? Hmm? Say again? What, what is a geometric, you are correct, it is a geometric distribution. What, what is a geometric distribution? But it's kind of exactly what you described there, it's the number of, of, of occurrences of an event until failure or success, depending on how you're modelling it, but it, it can be modelled, I think, in two ways, either the, the first occurrence of a failure or a success in this case, or it can be the number of failures until the first success. So there's a kind of two different variants. This is the one where you're modelling X1 as the number until and including the one that is the tails in, in your sure. example. Yeah. Um, now, expectation, um, I have to kind of have a bit of a refresher on how, how you calculate that. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a standard result, but I can't remember that. Um, Obviously, for expectation, you want to multiply the possible values that X1 can take by the probability of each of those values. Um, so I guess you could kind of, the issue here is it's not really a finite sum because X1 could, could go on forever. So you need to kind of multiply each of the probabilities by uh, the, the value it could take. So if you start with X1 equaling the smallest number it can be, which is one, which is if you get a tails immediately. Do you want me to write rather or? 
I should if you want to maybe write down your workings whilst you're, you're explaining that. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess if we kind of have a little maybe uh, a grid of the possible values of x1 and then the probability uh, x1 equals maybe i and the probability that x1 equals i. And we want to kind of find, I guess, to start with the first few values. So uh, if x1 is equal to 1, um, in this is first column, the probability there is is uh, simply one minus p because we're looking for the first tails, and the probability of heads as you wrote above it is p. Therefore, to get a tails, we 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 need to have one minus p. So there's only two outcomes. Um, nice. X one being two is the next step up, which I guess is the um, first toss of the coin is resulting with a head, which is p. And then by independence, the next toss of the coin is then a failure, which is one minus p. Uh, and we we go one more for, for three. The probability of of having x one equals three is two heads, so p squared, which is is oh my p's gone a little bit wonky there. P squared, okay. the first two heads again independently uh, distributed, and then one minus p again for the uh, the final toss of the coin. And then I guess this would kind of continue each time we're multiplying by a factor of p for an initial head. Um, and then what you would do is you multiply uh, the the value of x1 by the, the probability of that, and we'll end up with a kind of a sum here. Um, so I'll try and get this right first time, but we'll end up with uh, p to the, and then 1 minus p. To the, so the 1 minus p will just stay fixed all the time, and it will the p, if we go from k equals 1 to infinity, uh, p to the k minus 1, I believe. Uh, yeah, so what, what would this uh, what would this summation that you've written just now, what would that represent? That's the, the total probability of, of each of the outcome, which is the expectation. Um, not quite. So what you've done here is you've added up all of these probabilities, right? And that would just equal one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've missed the, probabilities. You have to multiply by this column, but I have missed that. You yeah. So how do we accommodate for that in our, in uh, our summation? We'd add a factor of k in here. Nice. Cool. So I'm not going to get you to evaluate that sum. Uh, in fact, I kind of will get you to evaluate it, but in a slightly different way. There's, there's multiple interesting ways you can evaluate this, and maybe we'll discuss that at the end. But you're absolutely right that this... The expected value can be evaluated by computing this infinite sum. Um, but we're going to try and calculate the expected value a slightly different way. So what we're going to do is use the law of conditional probability. Do you know what this is? Yes, but you'll you'll test me to kind of <laughs> apply it. <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a go. Sure. Well, broadly speaking, what, what is the law of conditional probability? You don't have to write anything down. Just uh, how do you maybe briefly explain it um so it's to do with kind of the probability of an outcome given another outcome so where there's kind of a dependent event uh, the probability of say a given b um is the probability of both a and b happening uh divided by the probability that b occurs so you're saying right of all the possible outcomes where b did happen we're looking for the ones where a also happened and that gives us the probability of a conditional on b occurring Ah, correct. Yeah. So, um, that's maybe maybe, maybe that, there, there is a name for that. Maybe I misspoke. Uh, I think uh, it's so, yeah, that, that's maybe more based theorem. The the theorem I was maybe looking for, or the the law of conditional probability. Oh, let's say someone, isn't it? It's the one where you sum over. Yes. Yes. It's the conditional the probability of a. Uh, if you take any subset of uh, a, a, a kind of other set of events, uh, then the probability of a given each of the outcomes of that other event. Um must all sum to the probability of a basically uh yeah yeah yes you're, you're right so uh informally speaking we would say that this is this the probability of some event a is the probability of a given b times the probability of b over all uh events b where b forms kind of this partition of uh yeah, that's the word. some set but um we won't we don't need to formalize it for this um, but we're going to use this idea of the law of conditional probability. What we're going to do is to, to work out the expected value of x1, we are going to ask ourselves what happens on the first coin toss. So we're flipping this coin a bunch of times. Either the first coin is tails, in which case, great, we you know x1 would be 1, or we flip it and it equals 
the first coin is heads. So using this idea of just purely thinking about what the first coin is, and then that will give you two possible scenarios for what the um, um, what the expected value of x1 is. How can we use that to maybe build an equation involving, uh, if I call this number maybe e, the expected value of x1? Uh, oh, I should probably shouldn't write that there. But if I let lowercase e be this expected value of x1, how could I build an equation involving e uh, using this idea, uh, using the law of conditional probability? Um, I guess you can condition on the first toss being being heads. Um, so you say, uh, let me try and think about how to mathematically represent this. But uh, yeah, we think so. The expectation of e, which is as you've written, e equal of x one, is equal to the probability. Oh, yeah. The, sorry, is equal to the expectation of x one given that um toss one i guess if we do t1 yeah, sure. is equal to heads plus the expectation of oh not expectation maybe i'm yeah sorry this should be probabilities not expectations right oh actually sorry yeah I, I, I also missed it this also works for expectation so this law of conditional expectation you can swap the e's here so the expected value of a is the sum of the expected values of a given b times um, the probabilities of B, but that, that's still a probability there. Yeah, yeah. So we have the expectation of X1 uh, times the probability that T1 equals H, which is the condition in that first one. And then similarly, probability of X1 given TOS1 is equal to tails times by the probability that TOS1 is equal to tails. Um, so uh, we can then kind of evaluate, simplify this down a little bit. I guess the expected value of x1 given that the first toss is hail tails. We're basically saying, well, we've definitely got at least one. And then we still, because of the independence of each of the throws, at that point, it's it's the kind of we expect x1 to have the same distribution again. So the expected value of x1, given that we know the first toss isn't tails, would be one plus the expected value of x1 again, which is one plus e. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um so I mean, let me just, yeah, I guess I, that's the yeah, first. Let me just be um, careful yeah. with your equal sign here. Just to, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Those two things are equal. I'm, I yeah. agree. Nice. Yeah. So we then, if you scroll down slightly, so I've got a little bit more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm not sure we can navigate it. Yeah. So now we have uh, the, um, oh, that's helpful, actually. Yeah. What have I written on the right hand side? Yeah. The expectation. So now we have E is equal to. 1 plus e times the probability that TOS1 is a heads, which is p, uh, plus the expectation for the second term, expectation of x1, given that TOS1 is a tails. Well, we know immediately that x1 is 1 um, if the first TOS is a tails. Um, so that expectation is just there's only one outcome there. So it is 1 um, mm -hmm. times the probability that TOS1 is a tails. So 1 times 1 minus p, which is the probability of TOS1 being a tails, um, which is therefore just plus the 1 minus p. Um, nice. And, and Absolutely correct. Good. Rearrange and solve for e, I guess, now that we've got an equation uh, for e in terms of p. Sure, yeah. What would we get if we make e the subject of this in terms of p? Uh, well, if we expand this this first set of terms, you have a, a p a factor of e on the right-hand side. If we bring that over to the left, then we get 1 minus p uh, factors of e is equal to p is the other term from expanding that first uh pairing on the right hand side uh, first product uh, add the one minus p i guess those p's on the right hand side then both cancel which means we get uh, e times one minus p is equal to one and then dividing through by the one minus p gives us e is equal to one over one minus p nice uh very very nice awesome um so nicely done and does this answer i guess intuitively make sense if we were to vary the values of p to be between strictly between zero and one, would this answer make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess so. If you had a, a high value of p, like close to one, say, then um, you'd expect that means that, that heads is more likely than tails. The coin is biased towards heads. You'd expect that this x one would have kind of a, a, a larger expectation, I'd say, because you're thinking you're more likely to have more 
heads in a row before you get to your first tails. So a large value of P would mean that denominator would get smaller and close to zero. Um, and therefore, the, the, the value of E of one divided by a smaller number would be bigger. And then I guess the reverse argument is true. If P gets a bit smaller, the denominator becomes bigger and the overall fraction gets smaller. And we expect X1 to be a smaller number if the coin is actually biased towards tails. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so nicely done. Um, so this is quite a cool technique. I think it's well, it's, it's kind of nice in the sense you don't have to evaluate some infinite sum because evaluating infinite sums, unless they're like geometric, which is kind of well known, it, you may need some nice trick or something. Uh, and this kind of avoids having to do that. Um, so what we're going to do now is build on this. And now, same idea, we're flipping a coin, same coin has probability P of landing on heads. Um, except now we are going to call this variable X2. And this is going to be uh, the number of tosses until we get two tails in a row. The number of tosses until we get two tails in a row. So similar to before, except now it's not just one tail in a row. We want two tails in a row. OK, and we're going to, again, try and compute the expected value of X2. So maybe we'll call this E2 is going to be the expected value of X2. How can we find what E2 is? I mean, I, I guess, so just to clarify, I think it has to be, it's not until we get two tails total, it has to be two consecutive tails. Correct, yeah. So if we got uh, heads, tails, heads, tails, that would not be good enough. We'd have to continue going until, maybe if the next one sells, that's fine. That would be X2 is five. But yeah, right. that's not good enough. Um, so yeah. Okay. Perfect. I guess following the, the the similar approach before, if we if we define um, e two to be uh, the expected value of x two, and then we can use a similar logic potentially uh, on the on the, a partition uh, of x. So if we say um, again, let's take toss one to be t one, um, we have e two the expected value of x two is equal to expected value of x2 given that toss one is equal to tails uh, times the probability that toss one is equal to tails i'll just scroll down for you in a second yeah um but okay. yeah sorry writing quite big on the screen but that's okay again. no worries uh and then similarly the same thing expected value of x2 given that toss one is equal to heads uh times the probability that toss one is equal to heads. Um, and then we can evaluate that in, in the same way, although I guess we won't get the same level of kind of simplification potentially. Um, yeah, which but... of these uh, expected value terms do you think is going to be easier to write, to like to simplify uh, these two circle terms? Which one do you think would be easier to simplify? Uh, I think the, the bottom one, because it'll be the same, right, as the logic we used before and that we're saying well if the first toss is heads uh then we have no more information about it the distribution will remain the same and it will be the the, the number of terms following that first throw to get our first two consecutive tails will be the same as the expected number of throws from the get-go so that that term i believe is is one plus e2 correct yeah that term would be one plus e2 how about this expected value on on the top here the first one that yeah that one be? that one might need maybe a further partition um or, or there might be kind of a bit more to do with that one. I guess it's it's definitely harder to evaluate than the other term. Um, you're saying that right now we have, I guess, a chance, an opportunity uh, to get a, a second tails in a row because we've got a first tails. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, we, you just need to kind of find uh, the expected value that the that X2, um, given the first toss is tails, is just the probability... Uh, that the second toss is tails um, times, I guess, two. No, hang on, I'm I'm oversimplifying that. Um, Not quite. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so you you had a right a good idea the first time. So we kind of would have to do do this under some partitions. So uh, for the sake of time, we won't go through to the details of this. But what you would probably do is have three conditions now. First one is if t one is h, as you uh, considered here. The second one if the, is if you have TH, so the, or not, maybe not, like T1, comma 2. So the first coin toss is tails, then heads. And yes. then the other one would be if you have T1, 2, equaling T, T. Um, yes. 
So this guy would kind of the con the contribution of this would be e one plus one, um, t multiplied by p. Um, yeah. So e one plus one being if the first co coin toss is heads, um, you kind of reset the game. The expected value goes up by one, and the probability of that is p. What would the corresponding contribution be for these two guys? Um. So I guess for 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 the lower one, you you know that. Uh, x2 at that point is 2 because you've had 2 tosses for the, for the lowest one so that oh, is the bottom one sorry the TT yeah one. sorry for the TT one I feel like it's a little bit simpler because you, you've immediately ended the game I guess at that yeah. point um, so you you um, times by the probability of getting 2 tails which would be 1 minus p squared um, yeah absolutely right so 2 times 1 minus p squared uh, Sorry, the two, oh yeah, as in two, the expected value, because it would be two tosses, yep. And then the expected value of T and then H, well, the probability of getting that, you, 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 um, you're obviously prescribing them that they're in that order as well. So I guess the probability of getting those would be P times one minus P, but without the factor of two, because it has to be that way around. And then at that point, um, our expected value, given though we've had two throws and we're no closer to getting two tails, would again be... E2, but we've had two throws already, so E2 plus two. Uh, good, yeah. I've also realized I put E1 here to mean E2. Um, but yes, E2 plus two. Yeah, absolutely right. And you'd get an equation. You can say E2 equals the sum of these things and then rearrange to work out E2. Um, awesome. Very nicely done. So um, we'll move on now to our second problem. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll discuss this problem near the end. But um, we'll dive into our second problem. So I'll maybe first just draw a quick line here. Um, just maybe readjust the zoom to 100%. Cool. Okay, so this one's going to be uh, maybe a slightly more calculus-based um, problem. Um, what I want you to do for me is for maybe positive values of x, can you just sketch the graph of sine x for me, please? So I'll draw you some axes, sine x for me. Right, you're testing my memory. I don't know. I've worked with the function sine x for a good few years. Pretty sure this is the one that starts start at the origin. Correct me if I'm immediately it wrong. It does start that. at the origin, yeah. <laughs> okay, we should be okay then. So sine x has kind of got this periodic uh, curvature like that. So I guess that we do kind of two periods of it. Um, it starts, although I haven't quite hit the origin there, it, it goes through the origin zero. I'll just move the axis, but yeah. Nice. Oh, brilliant technology these days um and the the kind of peaks of this are at value one and the troughs are at minus one sine x always takes a value with absolute size in between um well absolute size of less than one um and the period for the whole uh rotation over here is is two pi uh, which means we can kind of put uh, section over here as, as pi and then these peaks and troughs relatively are multiples of of, of pi plus two and three pi plus two uh, are great above the integers of zero, two pi, four pi, etc. Nice, awesome. And yeah, as you mentioned, it's periodic, goes on forever. Um, cool. So now, uh, if you're able to maybe change your pen color, maybe to blue, uh, so on the side, if you click the pen icon, yeah, then maybe the yeah, color should appear. So just, well, any color that isn't black or red, ideally, um, and that's visible. Um, and what I want you to do is on, uh, I want you to, well, on top of this set of axes, I want you to sketch the graph for me y equals e to the minus x times sine x. So using maybe the graph of sine x, which you very nicely drawn, using that as like kind of a um, a foundation, what would the graph of y equals e to the minus x times sine x look like? Um, well, I guess at each point, you kind of want to consider the, the, what the product would be. So maybe we start with a, a few different points. Um, uh e to the minus x so that graph uh if i draw am i able to draw that graph first so then we can factor them all are, you, are you able to what so draw just the graph of e to the e to the minus x first and we'll that just get sure yeah uh, yeah so feel free to yeah uh, um so e to the minus x um say x is zero then we get e to the zero so that's one so we know it starts at one up here um and then as x gets bigger uh, this will exponentially decrease. Um, so as, as x tends to positive infinity, e to the minus infinity, we tend to to, to zero. Yes. 
me just remembering my graph. So this will kind of come down like this in a kind of an exponential decay. Um, yeah, absolutely correct. Now that means when we multiply these two, the black and the blue line together, maybe I'll use a, another color, a green for the final final graph. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we'll, we'll retain the same period, but the, the sign kind of the height of the curves, I guess, will uh, be multiplied by the start will be multiplied by one. Um, but then as, as things progress, they'll, they'll decay as well in the same style of the, the exponential graph. So this graph will, I think, still intersect at all the same places. Um, it will just that the height and the distance away from the, the, the X axis will decrease as we go with time. So we'll start off kind of closely mirroring it and then get closer and closer to the axis each, each oscillation. Nice. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So yeah, uh, yeah, these, these would kind of pass through the same, as you said, obviously it's a little bit difficult to draw. So don't worry too much about that. Um, <clears throat> nice. So um, very nicely sketched here. Um, obviously this graph kind of look, I mean, from afar, maybe if you just looked at the green graph and someone said you said to you it was something like sine x, you'd probably agree. It's got this nice wavy nature. Um, you mentioned that the roots are at the same places, which I agree with. What about the turning points? Obviously, the, the green turning point here is much lower than the, the original sine x graph. But are the x values the same of the turning points? My intuition says no. I might have to kind of work on that. My intuition says no because uh, as x is increasing, say, in the range 0 to, to pi over 2, um, that decay is a little bit faster than in the range between pi over 2 than pi because of the nature of um, kind of the half-life, I guess, of an exponential curve that when it comes down, it's decreasing faster. The gradient gets less and less steep, um, which means I imagine the kind of the di distance from that um, black curve will will fall. But maybe my intuition is wrong. Maybe they are in the same place. But I guess if the kind of curve is constantly getting a little bit further away from the black curve, then maybe the turning point is happening a little bit earlier in that range zero to pi and similarly in all the other intervals. I, I I agree. I agree with the intuition. Uh, but of course, as you know, as a maths graduate, one thing we like in maths is, is rigorous. And so I appreciate the intuition. How can we now verify that that intuition is, is indeed correct? How could what could we do to um well we could we could differentiate the the the, the function given there for y equals e to minus x sine x uh, and set that equal to zero to find the, the points where uh, the gradient changes from positive to negative. Okay, nice. Yeah, so if we go through that, maybe just underneath, if you differentiate this function for me. Okay, so we have dy by dx, uh, and we can use the product rule, which means we differentiate one component of two factors that will make up y, uh, and leave the other alone, and then add to that the, the inverse, so we swap them around where we differentiate yeah. the other and leave one alone. So uh, if we first differentiate e to the minus x. Now, the exponential function, we just take the power down, but it remains the same. So that becomes uh, minus e to the minus x. And we're going to times that by sine x, uh, which has been left alone. So that's one uh, factor. Uh, that's a very poor looking x, but it is an x. And then we add to that when well, we leave uh, instead of the e to the minus x alone, and we differentiate sine x, uh, which Memory is telling me is cos x. Uh, yeah. It is cos x, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it goes minus when you do it again, right? Yeah. When you differentiate cos, it goes back oh, so to So when minus, you differentiate cos x, yeah, it turns to minus sin x. Just needed to check my <laughs> my A-level math there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so that, that I mean, they, you guess you can simplify that potentially by putting out the factor of e to the minus x, uh, which would then leave inside the brackets. Uh, a cos x oh, uh, minus a sine x inside. Cool. So what would the coordinates or the x coordinate of this first turning point of the green graph be? Um, so we now want to set this equal to zero uh, because we want the gradient to be zero to find the turning point at the value of x where the gradient uh, changes to negative. Um, so we set that equal to zero where we have I'll do it over here. If we set that equal to, uh, maybe I'm abusing mathematical notation here, but <laughs> we'll set that equal to zero. Now that basically means either that e to the minus x is zero itself, but we know that's never true. At least for finite values of x, it, the limit is is zero, but we can't have a value of x in the range of zero to pi where that's true. 
um, correct, which means yes. the the other factor in this kind of product that we have here has to be equal to zero, which means cos x minus sine x is zero, which means cos x equals sine x. Nice, yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> is there not a standard result where these two intersect? Um, I can't actually recall. Maybe this is a now. Now the A level students looking at me like, "What is this graduate doing?" Um, <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So that, of course, that, it's something you don't really do too much of it. You know, yeah. you kind of. It's only in a math course. So this, this is the first point of intersection here. I mean, you can think of it, for example, as dividing both sides by cos x, and you get tan x, tan x equals, x equals one. one. And yeah. I can tell you that x is pi by four. Um, so ah. does this agree with your claim earlier about the turning point? Absolutely not. That's that's. Uh, oh wait, no. Hang on. Let me go back to the graph. <laughs> so I scroll back up. To the oh graph. yeah, no. Yeah, no. It does. Sorry. Yeah, I I thought. I thought I was saying between pi and uh, pi over two and zero, but yes, yeah. So we're saying that the first turning point in the range zero to pi actually occurs only a quarter of the way into that into that interval. Yeah, as opposed to sine x, which is half of the way. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Nice. Um, how much time have we got? Okay. Cool. What, what, what we'll do next is um, I'm gonna on my graph here. I'm gonna label some areas. So this first area between the sine. Uh, x graph and the e to the minus x sine x graph, I'm going to call that area A1. And then this area is going to be A2. This one here is going to be A3, and so on. This one here would be A4. So the area kind of bounded between like the multiples of pi and between these two curves is going to be like A n. Um, yep. Sounds good. So um we could go about calculating each a n uh, in terms of an integral uh, how would you calculate a n how would you represent the area of a n as an integral a n is is the is the, the n one of these areas uh correct yeah so the first like areas a1 next one a2 and so on okay so they're bounded between okay so a n is bounded uh, by, uh, so if we integrating between the two lines, I'm still in green here, hopefully that's okay. Uh, that's so the lower, the lower limit of the nth interval, so if we're thinking about the first interval had the lower limit of zero and the upper limit of pi, so the nth inner limit will have a lower limit of n uh, pi and an upper limit of n plus one pi. So just be careful that. So if you think about the first value, a1, that's going between 0 pi and pi. Um, so oh, what you yeah. Yeah. Like, that's fine. I can modify that and just put n plus 1 there. So we'll do a n plus 1. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you are right. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to be careful there. I still got it wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So between n pi or n minus 1 pi to a n. But yeah, a n plus 1 is, is that the interval. And we want to take the, the function that is going to be higher. So this is a odd number n plus well, I suppose it kind of depends which one's higher. But because it'd be below the graph, if we have a negative, we're going to subtract the one that's further away from the axis and the one that's closer away from the axis. So the higher one is uh, just the, the sine x, and we're going to subtract from that uh, the e to the minus x sine x. Uh, and then that's all going to be integrated with respect to x. So you're saying that this, for any value of n, this uh, integral would evaluate to a positive number, or would it for some time be negative? It would be negative, sorry, um, if you're talking below, because we're basically finding the the, the the area above the x-axis when we integrate. So we're finding the area between those two curves if, if it does happen to be in a trough rather than a peak, but the area will still be below the curve, which when you integrate will give a negative value. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So lazy way we can take care of this is just like, put some modular signs around the outside to give us the area. Um, but okay, cool. And I'm not going to get you to evaluate this integral, but if we, if I did get you to do it, what, how would you go about finding this integral? So just give me a broad outline of what you would do to compute that for, for a fixed value of n. How would you go about computing this integral? Uh, so... This is now testing my memory, I think. But I mean, my intuition was to take the sine x uh, out and then have uh, one minus e to the minus x. But then that still leaves you with a 
with a product. So instead, you could kind of integrate each part here. I guess the, the sinex integrates quite easily, so we don't need to worry about that. And then e to the minus x, you could use uh, integration by parts on that um, to uh, integrate. Um, you take u and v, or u and dv by dx as e to the minus x and sine x in a way that you can then uh, rearrange it to be a product of u and v and an integral of the other way around, um, which might still leave you with a product of e to the minus x and sine x. If you then did it a second time, you would get back to a product again of e to the minus x and minus sine x, which you could then rearrange that whole thing um, to kind of put the variable you're trying to find back on the other side um, and solve that equation. Nice, yeah. Uh, very, very nice. Yeah, so that's exactly how you would do it. Uh, it's not a very pretty calculation, but it, it does, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly how you do it. Um, nice, awesome. So we will uh, wrap up the interview there, so you can uh, take a big, big sigh of relief. Um, thank you very much for 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 uh, for that. Uh, what are your initial thoughts uh, from it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's stressful. I feel like yeah, it's it's maybe obviously part of my issue is just remembering some of the basic A level math terminology and concepts, but um yeah no I, I think it i think it was it was good it was kind of good that i tried to like talk through my thoughts and obviously you were able to kind of guide me where i went wrong and kind of give me kind of confirmation that i was doing the right thing or challenge my view if it if you felt like maybe i was on the right route but needed a bit more justification for it yeah i think uh you did you did very well i think especially given that a lot of this math you haven't seen in seven or so years seven eight years maybe so um like you mentioned like a couple of the a level stuff myself the only reason i'm kind of familiar with it is being being a maths tutor uh, otherwise yeah you definitely don't really focus on the derivatives of sine or cos really in a in a maths degree so uh it's kind of the last time you really would have seen it would have been a level um but yeah really uh really really did like it so i've made a few notes on, on this so we'll maybe go through those and then i'll talk a little bit just more about the problem so any any maths nerds watching who are a bit bit interested um but cool, we'll we'll start, we'll go back up to the first problem, this probability one. So um we'll come up here. Um cool. So um we we started off with this problem where it was just uh, tossing a coin however many times until we got one tail, and we were interested in how many like total tosses uh, that would require. Um so here um one, well, one thing you did here and also just kind of throughout is you explained very well, you were talking through your process, your thought process, and also kind of writing at the same time. And that's actually kind of a difficult skill, especially if you think uh, when you're in school, you're always taught not to talk about math. Like when you're, whenever you're assessed, it's in exams, your heads are down, you're kind of told to be in silence for the exam. So it's actually kind of a difficult skill or a skill that maybe most people aren't quite used to. So it's good to see that you were talking out loud, letting the interviewer know um, what you were thinking. Um, and you weren't, I felt like maybe you weren't 100% confident on what you did. So you broke it down. So you, you drew out this table, which I thought was really good. And you saw, okay, cool. There's this pattern of each time going down the this column and multiplying by P. Um, and then you expressed it as an infinite sum. You did forget the K, but once I prompted you, you realized, ah, okay, that's the, the factor that's, that's missing. Um, so yeah, I think that was done very well. So I'll come back to this sum, how we can evaluate this sum in just a moment. Um, but yeah, how, how did you find this first part of the problem? What are your thoughts? Maybe I did kind of throw you in on the, in the deep end here. Yeah, no, I, I think it was fine. I think actually, as you say, when I drew out the table, I kind of realized maybe it was a lot, lot simpler than I thought. I was thinking, okay, this, I, I, I had the intuition that it was going to be an infinite sum, but I, I kind of didn't really recall what it would be. And obviously dropping the K, I think I mentioned, right, we're going to multiply these to get the product. And then when I actually wrote the sum out, um, <laughs> you never get these sums first time. I have to look at them and be a bit like, oh, have I included everything I need to include in there? Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I think but if you did ask me to evaluate the sum, I would have been a bit like, oh, now you're testing my my knowledge of, of geometric, <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's also not quite geometric, which I'll mention in a moment because of this K factor here. Um, yeah. So we'll discuss that discuss it in a second one one thing i also forgot to mention which i thought you did really well was you you name dropped ah this is a geometric distribution um so i think it's always where possible if you can kind of name drop some buzzwords to kind of just purely illustrate yeah i've learned this before i, I know what this is um you know provided of course it's it's the correct name for it um but yeah this was definitely a geometric distribution um cool so let's move on now to how we went about evaluating it so you 
wrote it as an infinite sum. Then I said, okay, cool, we're going to now work it out in a slightly different way. Um, and I mentioned the law of conditional probability. I probably, that was probably also a mis misspeaking for me. Like, I, I don't know, that's the right word, typo, but speaking. Um, I probably should have said law of conditional expectation. Um, now, although this is not really something that's like definitely like mentioned on the A level syllabus, I'd say for anyone who's preparing for these interviews, it's definitely worth having in your toolkit. So, both the law of conditional um, probability and the law of conditional expectation. Uh, essentially, what this is, it's certainly the law of conditional probability is just a glorified tree diagram. So, you think back to GCSEs when you're doing these, these tree diagrams, and let's say, you know, this represents whether it's raining or sunny, and this represents whether you take the bus or you walk to school. If, for example, you want to know the probability you take the bus to school, you condition it on whether it's raining or whether it's sunny. Um, and that's essentially what the law of conditional probability is. And it's very similar for expectations. So anyone looking to have something to prepare for interviews, I would highly encourage um, practicing some problems that involve um, those. Um, and yeah, once you realize it was to do with this expectation, this law of conditional expectation, you got this equation up. You explained all these terms very, very well, um, especially like this guy you mentioned. Okay, cool. If the first one's head, we reset the game. The expected value goes, it's, well, it's now one plus E. Um, and yet you calculated this, rearranged it nicely, and you got this. And then I asked you, uh, does this make sense? And you gave a very good explanation. Um, maybe that's one thing that I would advise maybe for applicants just to give them that extra edges, automatically do that. So if you're getting a result, maybe just question yourself, especially if there's a lot of algebra to do and a lot of fiddling, fiddly stuff. Ask yourself, does that uh, result kind of intuitively make sense? So the way that Hamish did very well was he kind of varied the parameter P from being either a very small number or a very big number between zero and one. Um, so that's kind of by testing extremes, which is a very good technique to do just to kind of test your solution. Um, nice. Um, then for this like second part of the problem where you had to now have two tails in a row, um, again, you realize straight away, we're using a very similar technique to what we did above. That's almost always going to happen in these maths interview problems where you use something, a technique you used previously in one of maybe the easier parts of the problems and um, use it in a slightly later part of the problem as well. Um, so I thought you did that very nicely. You recognize, cool, I, I want to use a similar technique to before. Um, but yeah, you realize that that this conditioning on T1 equals T is still a bit fiddly because then you also need to worry about okay, what happens on the second coin toss. Um, but then with this hint of, okay, you have these three things, heads, tails, heads, or tails, tails, you recognize you, you, you are very happy to compute these three numbers. Um, for anyone who's watching at home who wants like a, maybe a, a stretch on this, ask yourself, what if you generalize this to X like K? So if you want to flip or ask yourself how many coin flips uh, on average do you expect to have to throw until you get K um, tails in a row? Um, so that's an interesting one and involves some very interesting um, techniques. And what's actually quite cool is you have to do lots of infinite sums in here um, to or lots of finite sums, but uh, there's an interesting way to evaluate them, which is related to the, the way that we'd evaluate that original infinite sum, which I'll come back to later. Um, anyway, uh, this problem, I think, uh, is, is quite a nice one. And uh, what were your thoughts on it when maybe you were solving it or now that you've had a chance to digest it? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's always the way that when you're kind of looking back over it, you you, you think it's simpler than when you were first struck with it. And you're like, oh, why didn't I think of that immediately? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, as you said, it's always useful to use the kind of technique. So I was like, well, definitely going to condition on that first step. Um, but then maybe I should have realized a bit quicker. We might need a little bit more information here and, and add an extra term to put that first one up again. Um, uh, yeah, use use the conditional probability on a, a wider range of outcomes of those first two coins rather than just the first one. Um, but yeah, no, it was it's a it's kind of a good question. Definitely that extension sounds quite quite interesting as well. Nice. Yeah, I I, I agree. It's, it's, you get this all the time with interview problems. That's really frustrating where you go. Oh, I should have got that. Well, also just with exams as well. When you leave an exam and you're chatting to your mates about it and go, oh, I should have got that. Um, that's definitely a common feeling sometimes. Um, for anyone who's watching who wants a, maybe a similar problem to this, which has this idea of condition, uh, conditioning or something, there's a very good question. I, I believe it's in MAT 2023. Um, so last year's uh, mass admissions test. Uh, I believe it's question five, um, but I can't quite remember. It's to do with the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and it has a, it, you know, you kind of derive these very interesting uh, equations 
uh, that the Fibonacci sequence satisfies. So if you've not done that before, it's been a while, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. Anyway, let's let's look at the second problem um, and we'll discuss that. So, uh, oh, actually, sorry, one thing I, I kind of ignored my notes there. One thing that uh, also you mentioned was independence. So in your explanation, you were also mentioning any assumptions you made. So you mentioned how you could kind of multiply these probabilities together via independence. So it's always good to just kind of mention any assumptions you're making. Um, cool. Let's have a look at the second problem. You sketch sine sin x, uh, well, maybe it's been a while since you sketched that, uh, so you weren't too sure on the intercept, but that's fine. Um, certainly as someone who was, who was about to do the interview, you'd obviously be currently be doing your A-levels. Um, so you'd be expected to do that with your eyes closed sort of thing. Uh, e to the minus x sine x, I really liked how you went about trying to sketch it. You first thought, okay, what does e to the minus x look like? You sketch it and you realize, okay, it's this decaying function that's positive. Uh, starts from one and decays. And so that's going to have an impact on this uh, sine x graph. Um, so it kind of just weighs it down. And you sketched it pretty well here. Um, yep, you differentiated it quite nicely. I'd say certainly in a maths, if you're applying to study maths, any derivatives they get you to do for the sake of differentiation might involve a bit more of a hands-on derivative. This was maybe a derivative you might see in a non-maths course. So like if you're applying, I don't know, to do... I don't know, engineering or something, you might have to differentiate something like this. But if you're asked to, if they were trying to assess your differentiation skills, which I doubt they probably are, but it'll probably be something a bit more uh, hands on. Um, so maybe put an e to the minus x squared or something in there. Um, but cool, uh, you differentiated that uh, well and you, uh, you know, the idea aligned with your intuition, which was good. And uh, yeah, you got this integral correct. Uh, just be careful with the limits. So uh, I think you did try and explain it, maybe just the nerves got to you there. Um, but yeah, I did like that you went, okay, is it n pi? Well, when n is one, you get this and probably just made a mistake there. Um, but yeah, that's always something you should do whenever you've got this, a sequence and you, you know, either you're one off or one above or one below or something. Um, but yeah, um, nicely, nicely done there. There were a couple more questions that we maybe didn't kind of get to, to get to answer here. So with interview problems, as I'm sure you know, um, is that it's not like they have a list of questions and then if you get through it, they go, right, that's fine, you can leave early. They kind of obviously want to have a lot of discussion. They'll have lots of kind of outcomes. If the student gets stuck on this, maybe we'll try and try and get them to approach the problem this way if a student gets stuck on this. Um, and then obviously, like, ideally, they they go through the, the easier parts of the problems and work their way through. Um, so I was going to ask you some stuff about um, maybe like the values of a, n, as n tends to infinity, um, what happens to maybe the sum of these ans or the sum of the reciprocals of these ans? Um, and there's lots of interesting questions you can ask, uh, uh, but to be honest, mo most of them do depend on us actually computing this integral, um, which isn't a super exciting integral to calculate. Um, but yeah, for anyone who is applying uh, to do maths, graph sketching is definitely a big part of uh, the application. I can always guarantee that you'll have a graph sketching question to do. So do make sure you practice it. Uh, the things that Hamish discussed were really quite good, like the intercepts, turning points, um, behavior as x tends to infinity. Um, those are all things you really want to consider when sketching a graph. Um, cool. How did you think the second problem went? Yeah, I think I think it was, again, okay. I think it was a little bit <laughs> challenging just remembering the graph shapes. But, um, I think, yeah, I like the kind of graph drawing exercises. I feel like, as you say, they, they actually become quite frequent. Um, you're kind of expected to have an intuition and and be able to work one out even if, even if it doesn't naturally come on, on on how a graph will behave and those kind of turning points and interceptions of various graphs. So um, I think felt that one was more kind of familiar to, to, to university maths a bit more. Nice, awesome. Um, so I'll just quickly go back up to this infinite sum here because I, I imagine there, there'll be some people keenly waiting for me to go, how on earth do you evaluate this this infinite sum? And there's kind of a few cool ways to do this. Um, but broadly speaking, you can factor out this one minus p. That's not super exciting. And essentially you're you're worrying about this sum here. And this might look awfully like like a derivative. And in fact, it is a derivative. So if we call this function um f of p for the time being, um, this is the sum from k is one to infinity. And if we maybe have a different function, g of p, and g of p is the sum of p to the power of k. This thing here is a geometric series, and we can work out the value of this geometric series um, just using the, the standard formula we expect it to know. So A over 1 minus R, which is P over 1 minus P. And that's what G of P is. 
and sort of doing a bit of hand waving and maybe uh, not really uh, uh, being super rigorous on why the, we can kind of differ bring the derivative inside the summation here, you can see that the derivative of g of p is broadly speaking going to be f of p. You may have to adjust for what happens when k is 1, um, but uh, I'll let you go through the details, but then you can just differentiate this function to get you the value of this function. Um, and uh, yeah, you can kind of see roughly speaking where that comes from, because we know the answer or this thing here evaluates to one over one minus P. We worked that out in the interview. Uh, so the derivative of this uh, turns out to be something like that. Um, but I'll let you go through the details. Um, the other way to evaluate it, which I think is quite nice, is if we, again, think of this summation, sum of k, p to k minus one, and just kind of write it out. So when k is one, this is just p, uh, well, p to the zero, so just one. Um, then when k is two, you get p, two lots of p to the one, but I'm going to write that as, well, just two p's. When you have k is three, you get three lots of p squared, and I'm going to write it like that. When you have k is four, you get four lots of p cubed, and maybe you can see where this is going. You're going to get this nice little triangle. And if you add up these guys, oh, the first column, that's going to be a geometric sum. Second guy is going to be another geometric sum. That's another geometric sum and so on. And all those geometric sums, you can add them up. And then those terms individually become geometric sum, uh, and which you can add up. So there's geometric sums within geometric sums. Um, but it's quite a nice little um, thing if you've not seen that before. So that's for anyone who has made it to the end of this video. So. Thank you so much if you have. Um, thank you very much, Hamish, for giving up your, your evening. Um, I really appreciate it. And especially given that uh, a lot of this math you won't have seen in, in many, many years. Um, do you have any any final comments? Um, yeah, I was, I was going to give a couple of tips, but I feel like you actually touched on quite a lot of them there. I think that the main one is that I would remember it might be more applicable when they were in person and you were around lots of other people doing the same interviews as you. Um, but don't panic if people have different experiences to you because the interviewer might diverge and take a different approach depending on what argument you come up with or if you still want a certain point, they might have different questions. And similarly, they, they will have extension after extension at these questions. So you'll always feel like you might leave the interview feeling like they you, you didn't reach the end and therefore it went badly because you didn't get for everything they wanted to cover. But they they planned out for the most advanced student who will get through 20 extensions of the question so they, they're, yeah. they're never going to keep, you know, they're never going to end early, as you say. Um, and then I guess basically following on from that, it's, it's a really useful skill. I remember it even took me a bit of time in my first year to get used to it. Um, but you, you, all your exam questions will be structured like this, where you're kind of given a, a nice, easy intro part A, and you basically have to use that in a certain way to solve the kind of later parts of the question. I think um, maybe that's not as, as common in A-level. It'd be kind of distinct parts of the question um, where you're kind of doing the same thing in a different way or a different thing altogether. But I feel like it's quite common in, in our university exams, at Oxford at least, where uh, the, the first question will ask you to kind of write something down which you're expected to know or, or, or kind of solve something with a very simple uh, uh, yeah, solution. And then you'll kind of have to work out how you can apply that to something that maybe doesn't feel like you can use it, but you probably can yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's yeah. So you see those in the map uh, longer questions, which they had on some of the, the older papers. And step is a really good example. So if you're looking for types of questions to help you with interviews, so certainly map and step are a great way to 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 start. And there's plenty of problems there to uh, over the years to to have a look at. Awesome. Uh, so thank you very much, Hamish, and uh, thank you very much to the viewers at home. Uh, if you have enjoyed, please do uh, like and subscribe. And I'm going to try and make a few more of these interview uh, videos. So they seem to be going down pretty well. Um, let me know if you're applying to Oxford or Cambridge, and if so, what you're applying to and how you're feeling for interviews. Anyway, thanks so much. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.